Good afternoon, everyone. This is Amanda Harper, the Assistant Statewide Care Managers Coordinator. Welcome to our session seven of the Care Manager and Provider Information Sessions. Just a quick review, these are the second and fourth Wednesdays every month at noon. Our last session, session six on the IAM assessment tool, the demonstration is available on the website. That's both the recording and the materials. Today's session, session seven, is developing the action plan. We're gonna be partnering with Clinton County ARC. We have a habilitation plan writer, Kelly Normandin, that will be joining us today to do um, this presentation. And again, the presentation will be recorded and available on the website. As Juan has said, there is a box that's now available that says transfer or file transfer. And with that, you can download today's materials if you want um, and are able to download and, and print or follow along on your computer. Um, the materials will also, as they have been in the past, be posted to our website with the recording. So those are two different ways to access those materials. Um, our next session, in lieu of our session, is going to be our um, quarterly care managers conference. So there's um, a variety of topics for that conference. We're going to be reviewing the coordinated assessment system, otherwise known as the CAS. We will go through the reissued staff action plan and transition to people first care coordination, ADMs voting rights and several other topics. So that um, agenda and those materials will be shared prior to the June 5th conference through the Care Coordination Advisory. Different from these info sessions, the registration for the Quarterly Care Managers Conference is available through SLMS. So you can see advisory number 14-2019 for information with the link to SLMS and how to find that conference within that system. Um, so the link at the bottom of this slide is for these information sessions. It'll take you to the page where registration um, for upcoming sessions will be posted and all of the recordings and, and materials for past sessions. So as I said, today's topic is gonna to be developing the staff action plan. And just to note that there's a lot of information that's gonna be presented. Um, as with all of these sessions, your questions can be answered through the Q&A portion of the WebEx. And we ask that you really focus on the materials throughout. A lot of your questions will hopefully be answered, but we will um, leave time at the conclusion to review the questions that have been submitted and give some time for answering them. Questions that aren't answered, we encourage you to work closely with your supervisor at your provider agency or at your CCO um, to seek answers to those. So today's presentation, developing the staff action plan, is, as I said, in partnership with Clinton County ARC. And from the perspective of somebody who is really out there in the process of taking newly developed life plans and transitioning them into staff action plans. So she's gonna be following um, the information that has previously been shared by OPWDD. So we just wanted to make sure that people have access to the OPWDD staff action plan training. It is available through our SLMS system that this training is a combination of two that were done in December and January. So that is available for your viewing. Um, we also would like to note that today's presentation is based on the requirements for the staff action plan, which are outlined in the staff action plan program and billing requirements ADM. And to note that this ADM, as well as the transition to people first care coordination ADM were both reissued on May 9th. So you can find both of those documents at the link on this slide. As I said, we will be reviewing in further detail what was um, reissued, the information that was reissued in those ADMs at our June 5th conference. So if you have questions about those documents, um, please attend to that and hopefully you can um, get some clarity with those, with those documents. The changes are underlined in the ADMs um, to show what is different from the document that was issued prior to 5-9. 
Also to note, um, lastly, the life plan and staff action plan timeframes, we just want to highlight that they were extended that by December 31st, 2019, all people receiving services should have a life plan in place. And by March 1st, 2020, all individuals will have a staff action plan in place. So um, as, this, as this slide indicates, a life plan must be developed for individuals that are new to our service system. And even with these extended timeframes, the expectation is that life plans are being completed as soon as possible. So again, um, we will have Kelly Normandin with us today. She's going to go through a presentation developing the staff action plan, and she is with Clinton County ARC. So we really appreciate her um, partnering with us to develop these materials that provide some great um, examples of how to take the staff goals from the um, life plan and transition them into the staff action plan. So. Thank you. We're going to pause for a moment while we switch over to Kelly. Hello, everyone. As Amanda said, my name is Kelly, and I will be going over developing the staff action plan. So first, we're going to start um, talking about the requirements of the staff action plan. Um, the required components include the identifying information, the individual habilitative goals, valued outcomes, and provider assigned goals and the individual safeguards. So going over the identifying information for the staff action plan, and that encompasses the individual's name, their Medicaid ID number, the name of the habilitation provider, the Care Coordination Organization, or CCO, identification of the habilitation service, and the date of the life plan meeting or staff action plan review date, in which the staff action plan was developed or reviewed. So this next slide um, shows you the identifying information as it looks on a staff action plan. So at the very top, you'll see um, the agency name, which is otherwise known as the habilitation provider, and then you would also need to list the habilitation service. Uh, for example, we have on there is community habilitation, um, but it could be day habilitation, supported employment, whatever the service uh, for the staff action plan might be. And then you need the name of the individual, the staff action plan review date, the Medicaid number, and then the name of the care coordination, coordination organization or CCO. The individual goals or valued outcomes and provider assigned goals are also um, on the staff action plan. And these come from sections two and three of the individual's life plan. These will be used as a starting point to develop the staff action plan. And by use of a person-centered planning process, it should be determined how the staff action plan will be implemented. So during that person-centered planning process, you're going to be talking about what types of things will be listed in that staff action section of the plan so that everyone's on the same page as to how that plan is going to be implemented. Determining if the provider assigned goal is a goal, support, or task. A goal is defined as the person's ambition or effort or aim of desired result. So in order for it to be a goal, it will include teaching, instructing, and assisting the person to do something where there will be an outcome. A support is defined as giving assistance to the person to hold up or maintain at a desired level or keep something going. So for it to be a support, the provider assigned goal will be some type of assistance that is typically ongoing. And then a task is something that needs to occur. These are not habilitative and will not be billed for. It should be a collaborative process driven by the person. The person circle of support and service providers are involved, and the person and the care manager should facilitate the meeting. With the person in the driver's seat, the meeting should be a collaborative effort involving the person, his or her circle of support, and service providers. Factors to consider when discussing sections two and three of the life plan in conjunction with development of the staff action plan. 
So is it a goal, support, or task? It is important to use the definitions just discussed to determine whether or not the provider assigned goal is a goal, support, or task based on the person's wants and needs. An example of a support versus a goal could be support, I need assistance to ensure my oral hygiene is thoroughly completed, versus a goal, I want to learn how to independently complete my oral hygiene. Next, how can certain supports or goals be combined in a staff action plan to best benefit the person? An example of this would be if the person has the following two supports in the life plan assigned to the same habilitation provider. For example, a support of provide an exercise program and a support of assistance to make healthy food choices. Under the valued outcome, I want to maintain a healthy lifestyle. The staff action area of the plan could incorporate staff supports and encompass both how the staff will assist the person to make healthy food choices based on their specified diet and how they could, in, could support the person to exercise. These supports will assist the person to maintain a healthy lifestyle in which they have indicated was important to them. And another thing to consider is, are there additional goals or supports that the person feel are important to them? Should they be listed in Section 2 or 3 of their life plan and addressed in their staff action plan? So it's really important during the meeting to figure out if there's anything not in the life plan that really should be added and then could be addressed in their staff action plan. With that may, being said, it may also be challenging for a person to achieve a large number of goals during the same time frame. It may be worth having a team discussion regarding whether or not goals would be better addressed by multiple providers, or if that is not an option, it could be discussed whether or not some of the goals should be on hold until the goals with greater priority are met first. The key is that the person should be making the final decision with the support of their providers and circle of support. Personal outcome measures, or the POMs, are in the staff action plan. And these come from the 21 POM indicators from the Council on Quality and Leadership, otherwise known as CQL. POMs are populated in section two of the life plan. And the person's goal or valued outcome should relate back to one of the 21 personal outcome measures. The POMs, in conjunction with the person's valued outcomes or goals, should be used as starting points for the instructions that will be listed in the staff action section of the person's plan. The staff action plan must address one or more of the strategies below. So there's skill acquisition retention. Staff, these methods will help the individual become more independent in some aspect of life. There's staff support. This may be used when the individual is not expected to independently perform the task without supervision. And this may also be used with preserving the individual's health or welfare or to reach a goal. Exploration of new experiences. This is a trial and error process and this allows for the person to make informed choices and identify new goals or valued outcomes. The individual safeguards of the IPOP section. The safeguards are listed in section three of the individual's life plan and these should be used as a starting point for the staff action plan. The staff action plan or other internal guidance documents developed by the habilitation provider needs to provide the individual specific information and detail the staff so the staff need to know how to implement the safeguards. Additionally, the life plan and the staff action plan must specifically reference where the additional detail is located. So this is an example of section two um, from a life plan and then how that transfers over into a staff action plan. So we'll go over this in detail. That way, everything we had, I kind of just talked about will hopefully be a little clearer. So if you're looking at the life plan, the CQL POM um, is people choose personal goals. And the valued outcome is I would like to access my community. Now looking over at the staff action plan, that's the first thing that's listed is I would like to access my community because that's the person's um, goal or valued outcome. So that's clearly listed and transferred directly over from the life plan right in, into the staff action plan. 
The provider assigned goal in the life plan is a support of pursue my hobbies and interests, assigned to the provider location and service type. So we're going to make sure that matches um, that heading on the plan. And the frequency and the quantity are uh, monthly for with a time frame of ongoing, and there are no special considerations. So looking over at the staff action plan, again, you'll see provider assigned goal with a support, pursue my hobbies and interests, and that's transferred directly over from the life plan. And then the staff action plan is a description so the staff know how to assist this person or support this person to pursue their hobbies and interests and in accessing the community. So we'll read the staff action over just so everyone kind of gets an idea of what that would look like. Obviously for every person it's different, it's tailored to their needs. Um, for this person it says, staff will assist me with accessing my community. Community activities that I enjoy include going to the arcade, going bowling, attending local craft fairs and going to aquariums. Staff may provide encouragement for me to participate in new community activities as sometimes I'm hesitant to try new things. Staff may encourage me to interact with my peers and or community members during these activities. Staff will assist me with this at least four times per month. So you'll see in that last sentence, the four times per month comes directly from that life plan. So it's very clear to staff how frequent they need to provide that service. And so that staff looking at this know exactly how they, need, how they will support that person to reach or to maintain that goal. Next, we have an example from Section 3 of the Life Plan and how that is reflected over into the Staff Action Plan. So this is the Individual Safeguard IPOP section. So this one, um, we did three different examples. Um, the first goal-valued outcome is I want to move safely with a support, the provider assigned goal is a support of verbal prompts to move safely. There's a provider location, service type, um, frequency and quantity are as needed with a time frame of ongoing with no special considerations. So looking at the top of the staff action plan, you'll see a goal valued outcome. Again, it's transferred exactly over from the life plan. I want to move safely with the provider assigned goal with the support of verbal prompts to move safely and how the staff will do that. So there's a clear description. Um, we don't need to read through all three, but we'll read through this one. It says staff will provide me with verbal prompts to move safely. I may need reminders to watch out for hazards because at times I may not pay attention to where I am walking. See my ambulation procedure for additional guidance with a frequency of as needed. So staff have a good understanding of how they will assist this person to move safely. They know that it needs to be provided on an as needed basis so whenever they're moving. And they also know that there's that amb ambulation procedure that they need to look at for the additional guidance when the person is moving around. So it's very important that staff have all those clear um, guidance right in that staff, and staff action area and that the frequency is very clear as well. So moving down to the next one, the goal valued outcome is I want to move safely with a provider assigned goal of provide contact guarding. And again, you see the provider location, service type, the frequency, the quantity, a time frame of ongoing and the special considerations. So again, it transfers right over into that staff action plan. The goal valued outcome is I want to move safely. The provider assigned goal is provide contact guarding with a clear staff action on how um, that is going to be acted out with the frequency there as well. And then moving down to the third one, the goal valued outcome is I need supervision at home with the support of frequent checks, less than 30 minutes, with a provider a location, the frequency as needed, quantity as needed, with a time frame of ongoing and no special considerations. And I know this is um, one that some people have struggled with because of how it's assigned in the life plan. Um, sometimes it may not word for word exactly meet the, um, what you're providing for supervision. So for example, this person needs supervision at home, the checks, they're frequent, but less than 30 minutes. So in the staff action, it's broken down while I'm at home, staff will check on me every 15 minutes. So it's less than that 30 minute time frame, which was um, how that was spelled out in the life plan, but um, we're making it a little more clear for staff in that staff action area. And then the frequencies listed as, as needed. 
So it's really important that the safeguard is not, um, so for example, we couldn't put that the person could be checked on every 45 minutes because that wouldn't match that provider assigned goal. So we need to make sure that those match up and that staff really understand how frequent that person needs to be checked on, whether it's at home, in the community, and this kind of goes for any assigned safeguard. And then underneath that, that's, so this is, for example, the end of the plan, there's the signature area. So there's the staff action plan author's name, their title, the staff action plan signature, and the date that they're signing the plan. There are areas for other signatures, and those are optional as it states there on the bottom of that plan. And then lastly, we have section three, another example. Um, this is a different service example. This is one for supported employment, just to give people a different idea of um, how things, how different services can be put into the staff action plan. And this also shows how a few different goals can be kind of incorporated into the same staff action, especially because these are all under the same valued outcome. Um, so we'll kind of start at the top again at, of the life plan. The goal valued outcome is I want to maintain employment with a provider assigned goal of teach work skills. So it shows the provider location, once again, service type, the frequency is four quantities monthly, time frame is ongoing, and special considerations are none. Um, you'll notice there are no POMs listed um, in section three. Um, I didn't mention that the last time on the last slide, but um, so POMs are only generated for section two, so section three we won't see those on the life plan. So going back to this one, um, the, the valued outcome for all three is I want to maintain employment. So we have that listed. First thing is I want to maintain employment on the staff action plan. And then you'll notice under the provider assigned safeguard goal, we've listed all three of these. So it's um, teach work skills, teach work habits, and teach social skills. So these are all assisting that person to maintain employment. And they all have the same frequency. So we're going to put them all together so that staff uh, it can make for a more robust staff action so staff really know how to help this person maintain their employment. Um, so we can read through the staff action because um, I think it's really good to see how everything is described clearly. So staff will assist me to learn new job skills if needed. I require task instruction to be clear, simple, and may need it to be repeated. Staff will monitor my job skill development and ensure expectations are met. Staff will work with my employer to ensure expectations are clear regarding job performance. Staff will assist me with learning to remain focused on a task and not letting things around me become a distraction. Staff will assist me with strategies to appropriately and effectively communicate with coworkers and supervisors. And this will include being understood by speaking clearly and concisely. And staff will also assist me with reading materials given on the job and filling out paperwork if needed by my employer. The frequency is four times a month. So staff have a really good idea of the things a person needs to be assisted with um, in order to maintain their employment and kind of feeding off of those goals that were assigned in that life plan. And they also clearly know that the frequency needs to be a minimal, minimum of four times a month. And then underneath that, the bottom of the staff action plan, if this were the end of the staff action plan, again, you're gonna have the staff action plan author's name, their title, um, the staff action plan author's signature, and then the date. And again, the other signature areas are included on the staff action plan example, but they are optional as stated on the plan. And then um, finally, we're just gonna kind of recap with the staff action plan billing standards. These are all um, required to be part of the staff action plan um, in order for the habilitation provider to bill for those services they provided. So we'll read through those. Um, they are the individual's name, individual's Medicaid number, the habilitation service provider's agency name, the name of the habilitation service provided, the date, so that needs to include the day, month, and year of the life plan meeting or staff action plan review from which the staff action plan was developed, goals valued outcomes from the individual's life plan, and the provider assigned goals from the individual's life plan, Description of services and supports and identification of the frequency from sections two and three of the life plan. The safeguards. The printed name, signature, and title of the person who wrote the staff action plan. The date, which again needs to include the day, month, and year that the author signed the plan. 
evidence that the staff action plan was distributed no later than 60 days after the start of the billetation service, life plan review date, or staff action plan revision, whichever were to come first. And you also need evidence the staff action plan was reviewed at least twice annually. This review must include a review sign-in sheet, a service note indicating the review took place, and a revised and updated staff action plan. And finally, evidence of the review must include individual's name, the habilitation service, the staff signature, and date of the staff signature and the date of the review. So we're going to pause briefly um, and review the questions, and then we will come back on. Hi, everybody. Thank you for your patience while we reviewed the questions. Um, this is Angie Francis, and I'm just going to run through um, some answers to some of the, the main questions that we received during um, the presentation. One of the questions was how and where in the life plan to indicate that a goal, um, you know, was discussed but will be on hold and um, not assigned to a provider during this review period. Um, and during that person-centered planning meeting, it, the decision is made and the conversation is had on what goals the individual would like to work on during this review period and what providers. And anything else that, you know, is saved for later or will be addressed at another time can be documented um, in the narrative section or there's also the um, IDT or interdisciplinary team summary at the end of a life plan. So it could be summarized there as well. Um, but, you know, wherever makes sense within that life plan to document that an individual does have, um, you know, the de desire to work on other goals at another time and, you know, it can be, you know, broadly documented what they may be. Um, another question that we received was about um, a provider kind of combining goals in a staff action plan. So the requirement is that the provider assigned goals that are identified in the life plan must be written on the staff action plan as in the example shown here today. But then as a provider developing your staff action plan, um, in your further detail, you can detail how you're going to address those goals. So if in your detail you combine them, um, that is fine so long as you're combining and providing information for staff on how to support an individual to achieve the goals and that you're indeed providing enough information to support any goals that you combine. Um, so I hope that helps to answer that question. Um, we also received a couple questions about documentation for billing. Um, you know, we have provided guidance that goals and supports um, can be um, billable if they're achieving um, what they need to, and the standards for the documentation for billing has not changed. So depending on the service that you are providing, you would refer to that ADM for the billing documentation standards. Another question that we received was about um, using the OPWDD staff action plan template. The examples given here today um, are on the OPWDD staff action plan template, but please note that that is just a template and providers can choose to create their own template so long as it has the minimum OPWDD requirements captured on it. Um, another question that we received was, do all of the goals listed for a program need to be included in the staff action plan? And the answer to that would be yes. All of the provider assigned goals to a particular provider, for, so let's use Community Hub, for example. So if there are three goals assigned to a Community Hub provider um, in somebody's life plan, then all three of those goals must be included in the staff action plan that the Community Hub provider is developing. Um, because that is where that provider will demonstrate what they are doing to help the individual achieve those goals. <clears throat> um, two things. We, we received a question um, 
about the example that was given in today's presentation. So I just want to provide some clarification. In today's presentation, we focused on sections two and three of the life plan and as they relate to the staff action plan. So the frequency, quantity, and time frame that are captured in a life plan in section two and three, those are the frequency, quantity, and time frame that a provider is going to work with an individual to achieve their goals. In section four of the life plan, which we did not cover today, documents the authorization of waiver services or other state paid authorized services. In section four, that is the billing standard. That is where the life plan needs to accurately document the billing standards and requirements for that service as it relates to the service specific ADM. So, in today's example, um, the example was used for community hab, and the goal was going to be worked on four times a month. That is the frequency in which the provider is going to work with the individual on that stated goal or support. It is not a billing standard. It is, um, you know, the, the person-centered planning that was done um, and determined on how often the individual is going to work on their goal. In section four is where the billing standard would be documented. And again, we did not cover that in today's presentation. So I hope that helps to clarify um, the difference between how frequency and quantity and time frame is captured in section two and three of the life plan um, versus the information that is captured in section four and the difference between goal and support delivery versus um, service authorization documentation requirements. I, I know that was a little bit long-winded, but I hope that helps to clarify that. Um, one of the other questions we received was, how would a provider document safeguards not on a life plan? Um, if an individual has safeguard needs or support, they need to be documented in the life plan. And then the habilitation providers would further detail that safeguard need in their staff action plan. If a safeguard um, in a life plan is um, assigned to somebody other than a habilitation provider, um, respite, for example, they do not have a staff action plan. However, the respite provider would still be responsible for ensuring the safeguard while that individual is at the respite program. So they would use the life plan and or any other um, documents referenced within the life plan to provide that support. Um, we also received another question about if there are only a certain number of goals assigned to a provider, um, can you add more um, goals that would be billable? Um, again, the staff, the life plan um, identifies those provider assigned goals and the staff action plan would just provide further detail. So if you are a provider and all of the goals you are working on are not captured in the life plan, um, during the life plan review meeting, you would have this conversation with the entire care planning team um, and ensure that the life plan accurately reflects the goals um, and supports that the individual wants and what providers are working on. Those were all of the questions that I had um, before we... Um, okay, so we can over. pause and look at some of the other things that have come in. Um, we do have a lot of questions coming in now, and many of them have been spoken to and are answered um, in re-reviewing these presentation materials, but we do also take this information into consideration um, with future guidance that we issue. So we'll pause for one more moment to see if there's any other questions that we can speak to today. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We have a few more questions 
that we'll speak to. Um, the first question is what if something on the life plan doesn't make sense or it lists a service in section four in some type of inaccurate way? Do you put it over on the staff action plan correctly or what do you do? So um, just recently OPWDD um, issued the revised transition to people first care coordination ADM and within that ADM um, it goes into great detail about um, how to um, collaborate to revise life plans and um, can work through these, these dispute resolutions or inaccuracies. So we strongly encourage you to read that ADM in full and follow those processes, but essentially you're not going to, if something is inaccurate in a life plan, um, as part of the care planning team, um, it is up to you to work with the care manager and the rest of the team to ensure that the life plan is accurate. Um, you know, the life plan is that guiding plan of care um, and should not reflect inaccuracies. I know that we are in a time of transition and we are working through um, some issues and trying to, you know, get to perfect life plans. Um, but really there needs to be collaboration and conversation to make sure the life plan is as accurate as possible. Um, and you would not carry it, something that's inaccurate over onto a staff action plan. You want to document how you're working with the care manager or your efforts to have it corrected um, and work on um, making sure that it's documented correctly. Thank you. I would also just like to note that um, a couple of questions came up about the IM assessment tool and that those questions can be answered by the previous um, <clears throat> training mentioned at the beginning, the IAM demonstration, so please refer to that training and materials. Um, next question is, um, what, if, how is the distribution of the staff action plan to the care manager documented? So the staff action plan ADM provides information on how to document this and it can be done in multiple ways. Um, again, an agreed upon mechanism between you as the provider and the care manager, um, which is not limited to email or mail or um, using some other um, agreed upon mechanism. So please refer to the staff action plan ADM um, as well as the transition to people's first care coordination ADM because it's also um, discussed in there. Okay, thank you. And um, there was a question about some of the goals that come through in section three of the life plan. So can you just speak to that specifically? Employment goals might end up in section two and three. Yep, um, and I know that we've talked about this um, a few times, but it, you know, it, it is a little confusing. So um, just to reiterate, goals and supports assigned to any waiver provider can be documented in section two or three of the life plan. That includes um, any employment goals as well. Um, and I don't remember the exact date, but we did a employment um, lunch and learn session that um, is posted on our website that goes into great de detail, has great examples um, of specifically about employment. So would ask you to refer to that as well. But I would just like to say that um, we do recognize that the title of Section 3 is Safeguards and Individual Plan of Protective Oversight, but um, as you can tell through this development and, you know, process of developing a life plan, Section 3 is indeed more robust than just safeguards um, and does capture other goals and supports, some of which are assigned to waiver providers, which is perfectly acceptable. It was on April 10th that we had the employment oh, um, training and that recording and materials are both available and very useful. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, we have another question that we'll throw out to our waiver unit who is also in attendance um, regarding documenting therapeutic leave and retainer days. So therapeutic leave days are documented in the residential habilitation staff action plan. It's not documented in the life plan. And it just needs to be just a general statement of how the person will use therapeutic leave. And that is described in ADM 2014-01 regarding supervised residential habilitation services. 
Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there was a lot of material covered today and we really appreciate the time that everyone took to attend and to send in thoughtful questions. Like I said, we continue to review these after the presentation to see um, what questions people continue to have. We encourage that you review the prior presentations that we've done and the new ADMs at the link at the beginning of this presentation um, for further answers to the questions that you have. Um, again, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.